Once around, Wolf 359. So in the constellation of Leo, lying very, very close to the line of the ecliptic where the planets and the sun tend to pass around the sky from our point of view, uh, caused, of course, by really us orbiting around the sun, is a little tiny red dwarf star, very faint at magnitude 13.5, Marked on the diagram there, you can see it as the red dot just near that red line. That's the ecliptic just passing by the brightest star in Leo, Regulus. And this star is very famous. It's Wolf 359. Number 359 in Wolf's catalogue of stars that he made because they showed high degree of proper motion across the sky. So proper motion is where nearby stars seem to change their position year on year on year against the background of much, much more distant stars that do change, but on incredibly long timescales. And so Wolf 359 was measured and recorded at 4.7 arc seconds per year. Um, an arc second is a 60th of an arc minute, which is a 60th of a degree. So 4.7 of these is not very much at all. These took very, very sensitive measurements to track down. And once you've identified a star that has a high proper motion, it's worth trying to look at the distance using the parallax method. You uh, use the Earth's orbit as a baseline and work out how far away the star is, again, by its annual motion, caused again by the Earth going from one side of its orbit to the other, giving you a 300 million kilometer long baseline for a very, very long, thin triangle. And you can work out the distance. And that came to 7.9 light years for Wolf 359. Now, I've got this sort of radar plot of the stars in and around the neighborhood of Sol, our sun. And you can see we have the Alpha Centauri group, we have Barnard's star, and just down at the bottom there, we have Wolf 359. And the brown arrows are indicating the direction of movement and speed. You can see that Alpha Centauri is coming towards us quite fast, as is a little group called Lumen 16, which is a subject of another video. But Wolf 359 is just slowly moving away from us. I say slowly, 19 kilometers per second. That's about the same speed that the Earth orbits the Sun, so it's pretty fast by human standards, but the Sun is doing several hundred kilometers per uh, second around the uh, center of the galaxy. And Wolf 359 moves around the galaxy as well. It's part of what's known as the population of old disk stars on an orbit that takes it from about 20,000, 20,500 light years to about 28,000. So slightly elliptical orbit around the center of the galaxy with a modest eccentricity of 0 0.16 there. Zero would be perfectly circular. And as with the sun, these orbits are perturbed and deflected by the gravity of the mass in the spiral arms and in other structures within the Milky Way. And so it moves above and below the galactic plane as it goes around by about plus or minus 500, uh, sorry, 400 light years. The thickness of the disk of the Milky Way is perhaps between one and 5,000 light years, depending on where you define the edge. So it's a significant portion, but uh, not outrageous. So Wolf 359, I said it was a small, faint red dwarf star, and it is. It's one of the smallest stars that we know of. It's just 11% the mass of our sun, 14% the radius, and only 40% larger than the planet Jupiter. And I love this graphic that really illustrates that. And with that low mass goes a low rate of nuclear fusion. You have low temperatures and low pressures in the core. So these are quite slow burners, and the temperature on the surface of Wolf 359 is just 2,800 Kelvin, uh, below that 3,000 that we normally associate with being red hot. So this is a very cool star indeed. Um, 
it goes with the territory. It's only got one one thousandth of the total heat output of our sun. Um, it's burning away so slowly. And you can see that with, with roughly one tenth of the radius, you would have one one hundredth of the uh, surface area. Um, but the power output is one one thousandth. And that's a reflection of the way that the lower temperature also reduces the power, um, all down to Stefan Boltzmann law, which I've discussed in other videos. Now, the age is a little bit more difficult with this one. It seems to be problematic. There's a very wide range, somewhere from at least 100 million to 1.5 billion years. And the lower bound of 100 million is because we can't see any lithium in the surface of the star. And this is because these small-sized stars burn lithium. The uh, nuclear fusion occurs with either uh, of the isotopes of lithium. Lithium-7 is gets hit by a proton and then fissions, in fact, to two helium nuclei. So you can view it as induced fission if you want to think about it that way. And it gets burnt up. And uh, lithium-6, well, that can uh, absorb a neutron, breed more lithium-7, and then undergo this uh, accelerated fission process. But nevertheless, all the lithium t in a modest-sized star tends to be gone in less than 100 million years. And so that's what we're seeing here. And the upper bound of 1.5 billion is based more on the rotation. It takes a while for stars to lose their initial loadout of angular momentum. They will emit material in the form of a stellar wind away from the surface, and you can estimate the stellar wind and indeed measure it in many cases. And it seems that that interaction between that and the magnetic field of the star acts like a friction break and gradually slows down the rotation. And um, Wolf 359 is rotating really quite slowly now, and so it's most likely that it's uh, as old as one and a half billion years already. But this is a very wide range. And in terms of lifetime, well, at such a tiny mass, it hasn't got much fuel, but it's burning it so incredibly slowly. Um, and it will burn it all because these little red dwarf stars are fully stirred. They're fully convective. They access all the available hydrogen. Um, unlike a star like the Sun, that will be very wasteful and leave a lot of the hydrogen left over. And so this guy is going to live around three trillion years. Quite incredible. Much longer than the current age of the universe. Now, that low temperature also gives rise to something strange in the spectrum. It's below the ionization temperature of many uh, chemical bonds. And so we are able to see molecules, carbon monoxide, water, um, metal hydrides, things like iron hydride, cobalt hydride, forming in the star. And indeed, oxides, t titanium oxide is often uh, one that gets detected. We use that in white paint, don't we? But uh, we can see the stretching of the bonds in the infrared part of the spectrum and make all sorts of detections in the outer layers of the star, just because it's below that uh, 3,000 degrees. But these red dwarf stars, they sound placid and low and slow, but they do make flares, and it's the case with pretty much all of them. They vary in how powerful and how often these flares occur, and this particular chart here is, in fact, uh, Wolf 359, also known as C.N. Leonis. And uh, it releases quite powerful flares occasionally. And when it does, they carry with them a lot of energy, a lot of radio waves, but also ultraviolet, X-ray and gamma ray radiation. So uh, it's not good to be near one when one of these flares goes off, unless you have some sort of... Uh, amazing protection system, just because of the enormous radiation. Now, in terms of planets, this is something that I'm very interested in. I did some work once studying 
the uh, Kepler Space Telescope data to try to determine if we could find any transiting exoplanets and found a few candidates. Um, but here, the initial studies failed to reveal any uh, decent sized planets close in. So anything greater than or equal to the size of Neptune in a fairly close orbit was ruled out by a combination of the radial velocity studies and uh, no detections of any significant transits. But recently, the radial velocity method has suggested that we have a couple of planets based on the sort of curve that you see here. You can see the plotted points with their error bars. Their error bars are quite significant. They're nearly as big as the whole of the wobble, but you could convince yourself there was a periodic nature to that signal. Um, since the initial announcement of two planets, one of them has been ruled out, but the other one does indeed appear to be there. And this is quite a large planet indeed. It's uh, a super Neptune. It's 44 Earth masses and orbits not close to the star, 1.8 astronomical units. So that would, in our solar system, be beyond Mars. Um, so quite a large planet orbiting round for a very, very small star. And because that star is so small and has such a low power output, Wolf 359b is going to be chilly. It's going to receive a tiny fraction of the amount of heat that even Neptune does from the sun. So this is going to be a very cold world indeed. But I suspect we're going to find more smaller planets in uh, different orbits, perhaps closer in to Wolf 359 as our instrumentation and technology improves. And Wolf 359 being one of the nearest stars to the sun is a favourite of science fiction. And I particularly remember watching on a repeat. I wasn't uh, watching The Outer Limits in 1964. Not even I am that old, but I did watch it later. And there was an episode entitled Wolf 359, which had this strange ghostly alien uh, that was visiting uh, the poor protagonist of our story. Um, if you get a chance, do watch it, but it, um, it's uh, aged a little bit, shall we say. And it's also the case that Wolf 359 was the supposed location for the major Star Trek battle with the Borg. Um, I don't think the star plays any part other than just being a location fairly near the sun. And of course, everybody would heard of this uh, star in the uh, list of the 30 nearest stars to the sun. So I'll leave you with this picture here. Thanks very much for listening. The arrow is pointing at a very nice little image of Wolf 359 showing the little red dwarf star. Uh, you can see a couple of galaxies in that photo as well. Leo, of course, where it lives is the realm of the galaxies. So thanks very much for listening. And I hope you've enjoyed that trip once around Wolf 359.